real praise to our music. Lives are saved with our music. Life is made with our music because black music is music. We are music. We are the pulse of nations. Each chord strum, hum, raises our vibration. High like the antenna of your favorite station. Our music calms the savage and the anxious, the depressed and the angered. It don't matter if you're tuned in or standing in front of stages. Listening close becomes a beautiful habit. The earth spins to our records, the people are the axis, the needle in the groove, the peak and valley of every move, every mood. The colors seem brighter when the music plays along. The music sets us free, so they call them freedom songs. With every song written, kingdoms come, queens reign supreme. Every superhero needs a theme, so there's a soundtrack for every crown attached, for every heart worn on our sleeves. Our dreams are the seeds that are planted in melodies, nourished in harmonies. The village is healed with every single sound. We shine like the sun, there's even stars in the background. The music is the charge and the fight that won't let you back down. Black music is the epitome of hope. We write notes for the life notes, the lifetimes, the right times. Like history, we keep time. Keep in mind, there's a song for every lesson learned, for every blessing earned. Black music is love. It's precious, angelic, on the daily, we sample heaven, courageously interpolate our feelings with a message, sweet music that's destined to change lives. It's our warmth on the coldest nights, our light on the darkest days. Don't act like you ain't never heard the choir sing. Our voices have range, remedy for the pain. Every song is ingrained in our spirit. You hear it, you feel it. Every time the DJ kill it, every time there's a praise hands or a raise hands for a praise dance, we turn up because we can't be turned down. Oh my God, we're so profound. We're electrified by the energy. Our muscles memory is made up of miracles spirituals are tied to our tongues our music is played when battles are won when presidents are sworn in with their hands in the air each key is rare found there whenever you look there in your heart we are culture we are art. In fact, our souls are artifacts like tapestry and treasure. Black music is a treasure, a gift for the world. Every spoken word is felt in your core. We clap for encores because black music healed our people. Black music is healing our people. Whether it's jazz, blues, or rock, gospel, soul, or hip hop. The world prays to our music. Lives are saved with our music. Life is made with our music because black music is music. Good evening and welcome. My name is Harvey Mason Jr. and I'm CEO of the Recording Academy. Tonight, the Black Music Collective presents Protect Black Music, a conversation on preservation, legacy, and protecting the history of black music. As an organization known for celebrating the accomplishments of music creators, we understand the importance of honoring the contributions of those who paved the way. Over time, amazing progress has been made in all aspects of black music. It's now fully embedded in our culture. However, there was a time that that was not the case. There are still many things and inequities to be addressed and fixed. Tonight, we'll hear from legends like Smokey Robinson, Patti LaBelle, and Raphael Sadiq about their experiences as iconic artists, and thinkers and historians like Genzia Burgos and Sidney Madden on the work they're doing to preserve it. We'll have a special announcement of the three recipients of the BMC Amazon Music $10,000 HBCU scholarships, 
and we'll have a spoken word piece from one of our BMC people and national trustees, the amazing Jay Ivey. The future of black music is bright. Let's protect it. So thanks for hanging out with us tonight. Be sure to follow us on Instagram, at Black Music Collective. And I hope you enjoy tonight's program. Take it away, Sydney. Thanks, Harvey. What's up, everybody? And happy Black Music Month. And welcome to the panel discussion, Protect Black Music presented by the Recording Academy's Black Music Collective. I'm Sydney Madden. I'm a music journalist at NPR and one of the co-hosts of the investigative podcast, Louder Than a Riot, the series that traces the interconnected rise between hip hop and mass incarceration in America. Now, we all know that there would be no such thing as American music without Black music, without Black people. From spirituals to swing time, ragtime to R&B, P-Funk, Disco, Deep House, Hip Hop, and beyond. Our experiences, our stories are the soundtrack to America. But very often, that creativity and that culture, it gets co-opted, diluted, appropriated, or straight up jacked. Still, there's forward movement for redemption and preservation. We see it in the sights of the future. And that's what we're celebrating. Even just this month, there's legislation being introduced on Capitol Hill called the American Music Fairness Act, also known as the AMFM Act, which would ensure music creators, writers, composers, engineers are fairly compensated when their songs are played on the radio, same way they are in digital streams. So today, on one of the last days of Black Music Month 2021, Recording Academy's Black Music Collective has gathered this panel together to talk about our place in the past, the present and the future. So let's get into it. Please welcome my panelists. First up, we have one of Motown's finest, a pillar in the Black music community and the industry, a poet, songwriter, producer, mentor. And as you can see, that photo wall behind him, it chronicles over 60 years of an illustrious career. Please welcome the recipient of the Grammy Living Legend Award and so many other awards. Mr. Smokey Robinson. Hey, Smokey. Hello, everyone. Thank you, my love. Hello, everyone. Hey, Smokey. Hey, Smoke Smoke. Thanks for being right, here. <laughs> next Thank up, you. see if you can get this next person. A genre-spanning revolutionary, the godmother of soul, two-time Grammy winner, Grammy Hall of Famer, Miss Patty LaBelle. Hello. Hi. How are you all? Hey. Good. I, I see the I should have moved myself over so you could see the picture of us, you and me, behind me. <laughs> really? Oh, I, got a lot of I got a lot of pictures of us, girl. I ain't going to tell nobody how long we've been. I ain't going to tell nobody how long we've been knowing each other. <laughs> For 50,000 years, right? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Good years. That is the family atmosphere we as, need. As my, as my grandma used to say, since we were children. <laughs> Yes. Uh, <laughs> children. That's Absolutely. it. Oh, Absolutely. <laughs> yes. And next up, we've got one of American music's most versatile impresarios. Some singing, producing, scoring, music supervision. It goes on and on. And he's created some of the most potent, most impenetrable new classics that are coming out all the time. Oscar nominated and Grammy winning. Raphael Sadiq. Hey. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hey. You looking real cozy in your element too. I love it. I gotta you gotta be relaxed. You know, when you when you're sitting amongst two two legends like this, you know, you're like, when I got the phone calls, like, what? <laughs> of course. And finally, I want to welcome a fellow music journalist whose bylines at outline at Remescla and Pitchfork have sent waves through the world of cultural criticism and who she is a contemporary black music historian behind the site blackmusiclibrary.com, a digital library that aims to make resources about black music history as comprehensive and accessible as possible. Please welcome Gen Zia Burgos. Hey, Gen Zia. Hello. Hey. I'm just completely echoing everything Raphael said. I'm just thrilled to be in all of your company. It really is an honor and a privilege. Absolutely, yes. So now that we all family, we can get into it. I love 
as Gen Z has said, as we've all said, we're all huge fans of each other on here. And I love that each one of you brings a singular perspective to this universal love of Black music that we all have. And specifically, the three performing artists and Gen Zia, as one of my comrades in the media world and pros, you guys all have the ability to innovate. You have a chameleon-like quality that allows you to change as well as preserve your own artistic integrity along the way. So first off, I just wanna ask the group as a whole, what does preserving black music mean to you? I think black music is, is a key to our musical careers. <laughs> because, uh, but you know, um, see black music to me uh, began in fact, all American music, and I include everything. I include country and Western, or whatever American rhythm and blues, uh, blues, jazz, whatever it is. That all started in the cotton fields, you know, when black folks were out there just humming and humming to themselves and praising the Lord through music and just making up their own musical tributes and whatever there was <clears throat> right out in the cotton fields. That's all they could do to entertain themselves. I mean, they lived in uh, trying times when it was it was rough to be black. It's, it, you know, it's, it's better now, but you know, but back then it was absolutely ridiculous. So all they had to do, uh, all they had to entertain themselves was each other. And the music that they that 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 they created and that they hummed and that they sang in those cotton fields while they were toiling in in getting this together, I have a poem uh, that I that I wrote called "Being a Black American," and it's been online. I first introduced it. I introduced part of it on Deaf Poetry Jam when Russell uh, Simmons and and Stan Lathan had Deaf Poetry Jam on. I couldn't say the whole poem there because of the fact that. It's a time allotment thing on their show, it was on that show. So, but I have uh, released the whole poem now, it's been online, but it's called Being a Black American. And um, see, because I'm one of those black people who resents being called African-American. I resent that to the highest. I can't even tell you how much I resent that because, you know, I've been all over the world, basically. One of the places that I've never been is Africa. You know what I mean? I've never even, been to Africa. I've had some offers to go, but most of the offers that I had to go was doing apartheid, and I refused to go under those conditions. So I've never even been to Africa. And when you talk about African American, that's going way back to history. See, life started with human beings in Africa. So if I'm an African American, so are all the white people in America. So are all the people in Europe, and the people in the Orient and the people everywhere, we're all African, whatever that is, because Africa, Africa was where the origin of human, humanity started, you know. But that was back then. Since that time, for the last 400 years, you know, Black people have toiled and died and been mistreated and did everything helping to build this country helping to build America, helping to be, so why have we got to go back now and become African-Americans? We're American-Americans. There's a line in the poem that says, all the wonderful black Americans who served in the armed, force, armed forces and gave their lives in all the wars, they didn't do that for Timbuktu or Cape Town or Kenya. They died for Mississippi and Alabama and Georgia and Louisiana and Texas and Virginia. You know, continue because, and if you don't acknowledge that, if you don't claim that, and you're playing right into the hand of the white supremacist and the Ku Klux Klan who claim that they own this land. You know, we have done everything here. We even raised their babies. We cooked their food. We did everything. We built the buildings. We tilled the soil. We've done everything. This is ours too. I'm an American American. I'm a black man who is an American American. I'm a black American. You know, all that African American stuff like that. Like I said, that's in the past. I don't claim that. I claim what my people have fought and died for and are living through right now. I claim that. I claim America because that's who I am. I'm a black American. I'm not an African American because like I said, I ain't never even been to Africa. And I'm a mixture of a whole bunch of stuff. You know, I'm a mutt because I got everybody. My white people, Indians, 
you know, Native American, I, I, I was on a program called, uh, Who Do You Think You Are? In which they search out your heritage, you know? So I was actually born in Detroit. So I live in Los Angeles and Las Vegas now. So we started in Los Angeles with the Hall of Records here. Then we went to Detroit because that was where I was born. And we got the Hall of Records there. And then we went to, my mother was born in Memphis. So we went to Memphis. And uh, on my mother's side of my family, there were a whole bunch of white people, you know, and a whole bunch of Cherokee people and people like that, you know. So I found out that I am actually 47% Nigerian. I'm 15% Portuguese and the rest is Cherokee Indian. So I'm, I'm, I've got a whole lot of stuff going on in there. And for me to be labeled as an mm. African-American, like I said, if I'm an African-American, so is Donald Trump. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So is everybody in America, if it all started in Africa. And that's how I look at it. I look at it, it started in Africa, that was then. This is now. I'm living in this time. I'm trying to, I'm trying to do what I can to make America more suitable for black people. So I'm not gonna let anybody take that away from me. So being, being black and being in America, and like I said, even the music, that's what, what we start off talking about. The music that we listen to nowadays, all of it, as far as I'm concerned, started right there in those cotton fields with those black folks humming and praising the Lord and, and, and entertaining each other and themselves through music, that's all they had. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you, Smokey, what is, what is one of your first memories in the business where you realized you had to take ownership of your own voice? Uh, you, you, you know, somebody, I really don't know the answer to when I first realized that because I, 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 I've been singing ever since I opened my mouth. You know, I have two, I had two older sisters. They both passed on now. But my youngest sister was 14 when I was born, you know. And they used to tell me how, when I was like, as soon as I learned how to talk, they told me I, learned, I was singing before I learned how to talk. And um, it was always my, my dream. Uh, uh, I, I'm, I, I tell people all the time, I am so blessed. I am so very, very, very blessed because I get a chance to live my life, living my wildest, most impossible dream and make a living doing it, you know? So I'm, I'm, I'm blessed and, and I, I hate it when I see people tripping on themselves because they got a hit record or because the world knows them now. You know, I have seen, and Patty too, Patty has seen thousands, we've seen thousands yeah, oh, yeah. Baby. That come through, right? you know, because <laughs> they came in, they got a hit record, they got a little notoriety oh. and they thought that, oh man, the world is aware of me now, so it cannot possibly do without me. Mm. That's a bad mistake. You know what I'm saying? So, so let me like, so let me pose the same question to you then, Patty. When when did you first learn that you had to take ownership of your voice in this business that can just push you around and inflate you and let you fall just as easy? I learned that when I was first starting to sing um, as the Bluebells with a manager, a white Jewish manager, who said that I wasn't pretty enough. I was too black, and my nose was too wide. And my voice was too big, real smoky, real, real, my voice was too loud. And so he would put a stocking cap over the mic when I performed in the studio recording music. And I said to him one day, I'm too black, I'm too wide nosed, I'm too everything else, but the money is green. Mm -hmm. So in other words, oh yeah, girl. So it was like, they wanted what I had, but they didn't want to show me. Mm -hmm. So I owned myself, I owned my big nose, I owned everything about me because I was black and proud. And I knew and that fine. I had something that, that <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Smokey. I Your knew that it was something that I had, <laughs> something that I had that people really wanted and a white man couldn't suppress me and couldn't tell me that I'm not great mm -hmm. because of my nose and my blackness and my loud mouth. Mm. So. I found out who I was then and I busted it. You know, let him have it, you know, and I'm here. You stay, exactly, you still here and who's not? Mm -hmm. Raphael, let me ask you, in in such a such a, an illustrious career where you've moved into so many different lanes in the midst of changing your focus, how have you managed to preserve your ownership over your own creative process and your own intellectual outputs? 
Uh, well, for me, you know, I, I, I didn't I didn't start off as a singer. I started off as a, a bass player, <clears throat> a bass player. I played I played a lot of a lot of gospel earlier. You know, I started playing with a gospel quartet groups like a, like sort of like you would call it like a knockoff group, a local group of uh, like the Mighty Cause of Joy or the gospel keynotes, the Pilgrim Jubilees, Highway QCs and all those gospel groups I played with the other group, they were already 50 years old and I was like maybe nine years old and I used to work with my mom at the hospital. My mother's working in housekeeping. So she introduced me to these older men who were playing quartet, who, which I found out later was just so into God that they never really wanted to sing R and B. So that was my upbringing and I wasn't really singing anything at all. And once I started playing in school, playing in bands and, um, I got in a band and I sang one song and somebody said, you should be the lead singer. And from there, I was kind of really, you know, nervous about singing because everybody who I liked is were, uh, probably right. Is two people sitting in front of me right now. And, you know, Marvin, Motown, Earth, Wind and Fire, Sam Cooke, Donnie Hathaway, Aretha Franklin, you know, everybody. And I played for Vanessa Bell Armstrong when I was in high school. When she came to town, I was her bass player. I played for the Hawkins family. Um, so I had all this this background and I play for the baddest front men ever. So when I would play with them, I would always have, I was told to keep your eye on the lead singer, right? So I focused so much on the lead singer. When I was pushed to the front to sing in the Tonys, I just mimicked everybody that I was standing behind. And, um, and once I saw, I started working with the audience, I just started really playing this role. I started dress, playing dress up. So my thing was just like, I played dress up and, and um, mimicking people who I really liked. And then um, once I got, my, my whole mission was to get a nod. Cause I didn't think I could ever be better than anybody that I grew up liking. It was it's impossible to me, it's really impossible. So what I wanted was if I ran into Maurice White or, or Smokey or somebody like Patty and they look at me and they say hi to me, I could tell if they liked my music at some point. Even if they didn't say, hey, I love what you do. If they gave me a sort of a nod, I kind of knew that I, I kind of did what I was supposed to do. And that's how I got my voice in the industry from like, you know, running into like Stevie and people like that. And they would go, hey, man. And, you know, Stevie might sing like a couple words in my song and I would go, OK, that's all I can ask for. That's good for right. me. Right. That's how I found my voice. Right. That's wow. the lineage. These are the stories that that are behind the songs that are always behind our experiences. And, and a lot of these lessons and a lot of these um, rite of passages come from lived experiences. But then when the music or the culture gets co-opted or appropriated, that happens based on history time and time again. And Gen Z, I want to I want to pass it to you as our as our historian on the panel. Can you tell us a little bit more about why you even thought it necessary and, and pertinent right now to create something like the Black Music History Library? to preserve history and to set the record straight on some things when it comes to Black music? Just to go back to Smokey's earlier point, when we're talking about American music, we're talking about Black music, right? When we're talking about, and I would even venture to extend that beyond just America, you know, music of Latin America across the diaspora, there are Black people everywhere, you know? Enslaved people were brought to so many places aside from even just this country alone. Um, and for me as a music journalist, my background and my upbringing was indebted to this music. And it was something that I grew up listening to all these artists. It was just something that was a part of my reality and my understanding to why I even enjoyed music and thought to write about it in the first place. Um, but something that I started recognizing, I would say last year, um, after the deaths of George, George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, I was on social media a lot. And I think I started seeing people, you know, having these arguments about where black people fit in into, into all these different, you know, spaces in society, not beyond police brutality, but how are, how are black people being represented um, in fashion? How are black people being represented, uh, you know, in the business sector? How are black people being represented in music? And something I realized was that that reality of me understanding and knowing that American music is black music is not a fact that I should take for granted. It's not a fact that everybody is fully aware of all the time, I think. And I think it's very easy to forget it. I think that school systems don't always teach it. I think that 
the way that, you know, sometimes our awards systems are set up don't always represent that. Black artists can sometimes be siloed or pigeonholed into certain spaces. And so for me, that was really the, the light bulb moment where I was like, huh, people aren't realizing that all American music is Black music. And someone needs to help people understand where all their favorite music, where it's really rooted from, even the pop music that we listen to today, you know, who are the, the pioneers behind that sound? When we talk about rock and roll, who are the real rock legends? You know what I mean? Um, it's Chuck Berry. We're not talking about, you know, Elvis well, Presley. Richard. But, <laughs> right, you know, being the pioneer behind, you know, this, yes. this genre that you say is your favorite, maybe your favorite genre. And when I say you, I'm talking widely, obviously, but some folks, their favorite genre, they might have a different image of, of who really pioneered that and who started that. Um, and so that for me was the, was the real foundation behind why I started the library and started compiling resources. Mm -hmm. And why historically, I mean, this is, a, this is a rhetorical why, but I wanna open up the conversation about why historically there has not been an emphasis on preserving black music. Why black music are always the creators, always the worker bees, always the, the, the amazing producers of these things. And then they don't get the same ownership or the same recognition or the same preservation in it. I don't, my, yes, I it's gonna sound really simple, but racism, I mean, <laughs> you know <laughs> just <laughs> racism i it's and you know i think also then you know not to oversimplify but when we think about the culture of of opportunity right as as people of color i think often sometimes I, and i'm i'll speak for myself like when i see an opportunity i'll just say oh my god i'm so grateful just to have this you know we we talk about having to be so grateful and so um you know, just praising all of all of the, you know, the opportunity to even be in a space, but sometimes that gratitude and being taught to just be satisfied with what you have um, can also then breed a culture of not asking for more and not asking for the same and not asking for equality, right? And I think also, you know, there are, there are situations where people will also keep you in the dark as to what you're even worth, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's that whole ladder that you have to go through to figure out um, okay, what is, what is this white person getting? And what am I not getting? Um, and how can we make that a more equitable field for everyone? Yeah, speaking, going back to Ms. Patty's example about that, that person devaluing her talent and saying she wasn't this enough, that enough, yeah. You know, that's just something I always thought about. As, 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 as a Black musician, looking at Black artists and, 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 and the history of the family tree of Black music, when I look at Motown and I look at the history of um, a house of uh, a whole network of people working together, and creating music and creating teams and this whole flow of music, it's, it's only been a, a few crews similar that stuck together. I just find it, I don't see black people and black music really sticking together, really um, uplifting the art before them. We forget very fast about what happened two years, five years, 10 years before. We're so, maybe it's because I'm not blaming black people, also, but maybe it's because we're, so, we're, 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 we held back so, so for so long when we get on, we're just happy we got on and we forget about everything. We don't really want to bring anybody along, pick anybody up or, um, or carry anybody. And, and it's about, it's always about a healthy competition. Back in the day when somebody toured, there was all these great bands on tour, and the way we would, uh, from talking to Lionel Richie, the way we would piggyback, you will get on a tour with somebody that's, that's really good and you'll get on that tour and people will find out who you are from those tours. I don't feel like we have that anymore. Um, when the Tonys came out in 88, we were like, they, they were like, we were the last band to come out. And, you know, out at that time, besides like Mint Condition came out a few years after us. And so people would go, how does it feel to be the only band? And I thought they they, they thought I was going to say it feels great. I, I felt like it was terrible. I mean, I'm like, that's terrible. I felt like it should have been 20 bands out, you know. Um, um, yeah, you want I, your feel, I feel that's the, that's the thing. We don't we don't stick to, we don't stick together. That's just for real. It's just for real. And in a fan base, even with people buying tickets to black shows, um, black people don't buy tickets to shows. I mean, you, we go to a hip hop show and they go like, this is the best hip hop show, Kanye West and Jay-Z, but 
it's like five black people in the in the in the show. Maybe the tickets are too much. They cost too much. Maybe a hundred, two hundred dollars is too much now. But it's not too much for Jordan. So to get your hair done, I'm like, so I don't know. I think it's on both sides. I think it's like the music side. We don't stick together. And, and as far as supporting the 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 music, the music saved my life. I mean, black music saved my life. It was either I go outside and get into some trouble. Or I sit in the house and learn all these songs and or go down the street and knock on doors and tell my friends, hey, you play guitar, you play drums, you play bass. Let's get a band. It's a talent show at the Richmond Auditorium. Let's go compete. I feel like we have it in sports. We have it in, you know, sports kept, they kept this, uh, this professional attitude about them. And in music, I feel like we let go some of the most important things that we need to learn in music. And so to me, that's where it falls at. You look at trap music and all of that. I think trap music and like, even like the Migos, I feel like they're like blues. White people didn't understand what Albert King or, or certain blues, uh, Lightning and Hawks, what, what they were saying in their lyrics. They didn't understand it. You know, maybe you don't understand what the Migos are saying, but it's black music. It all stems from the beginning, like Smokey says, from the cotton fields, it, you know, um, chess records, not chess records, but um, Muscle Shows. Their first record was, they got the guy out the cotton field. He was singing in the cotton field. Their studio was here. He was in the cotton field. They pulled him out the cotton they field. Him up, got yeah. their first hit record. Well, Raphael, you I think that all. I think that also a uh, uh, factor in that is is uh, economic. You know the economy. One hundred percent. You know, see, um, uh, white people have have uh, traditionally had more money to spend on whatever they wanted to spend it on than black people. You know, and um, thank God for the white people who came around and said, "Okay, we love black music." And and uh, yeah. and we want it, and we're gonna buy it, and we're gonna go see these black artists, and we're gonna go see all that. You know, thank God for those people because it's economical too. Many many times and on many occasions, black folks just don't have the money to spend to buy music or to go to see an artist or whatever. You know, and um, so that's been a factor in 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 the uh, in the um, in the holding. I won't say holding back of black music. But you'll find that uh, a black artist, I, I would, I'll just use a, who, who I love, because I, I love Mick, I've known these guys for a while. I'll just use the Rolling Stones for an example. <clears throat> Rolling Stones have not really had a hit record in 20 years or more. They could fill up Dodger Stadium for seven nights in a row, and you won't even be able to get a ticket to get in. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. that's how loyal the white fans are to their people. You know, and they have the money to spend to be that loyal. You know, so that that would happen. Now you take uh, the only the only black artist that I can even think of who would be able to do something like that, and he's gone. Is Michael and mm -hmm. Prince. You know, and they're both gone, but they had that that same audience crossover. Yeah, the you know, crossover thing where they well they could fill up Dodger Stadium. Not like that, you know, but you got you got white artists, man, who are and it's always been that way. It is it has never been equal ground in music when it comes to the the buying and the, and the support, the financial support of it, and all that. It has never been equal ground because of the fact that white people have basically had the economic power and the, and and the money and the resources to support their artists. Or the artists that they love and that they that they care about. So uh, it's it's an economic situation also. I, but, I agree with that, uh, Smokey. Like I, I want to say said, before, yeah. it's like Rafi said. As, as black people, we got to start sticking together on all fronts. You well, know what it's I mean? interesting. But, it's so interesting you talk about power. We're talking about power and support and definitely protection. And there's the art form, and then the the commerce and the industry that's popped up all around it. And I. And sometimes within that industry, the, the person who's creating gets forsaken for the creation themselves. And there's, there's this type of support when it comes to who uh, blows up and then, and then how they're looked after is still severely lacking. And, and Raphael, I wanna, I wanna throw it to you once again. Do you feel the way that music is, is marketed and sold and consumed contributes to things like the artists not being taken care of, contributes to things like mental health problems in the industry and all of those residual effects? 
Well, like, like what Smokey said, the important thing is economics. You can't talk about one without talking about the other. And that's the number one important thing. But I, I like to say also, it's the economics with inside of a record industry, how you promote, what areas you promote in also. Um, the whole world doesn't know about us. I mean, I will know like a, a country song because it's in our, a big pop song because it's in every area. They have the power. The radio stations reach further but they won't know my song, right? Unless it crosses over. But then that's another thing that I like to touch on is um, promoters, black promoters. The way black promoters promote black artists is not the best. I mean, I don't feel like if you go see like an, um, a 90s show, you go see like God, Keith Sweat and New Edition, besides New Edition and maybe those groups. I mean, you have to give the audience, black people when they come to a show, you have to set it up so it looks good for black people to come see a show. I mean, you come to a black show, you can see from on the stage, you can see 7-Eleven through the back because there's no production. <laughs> it's like you have to give black people an experience. I feel like they lack the promoters. They get one or two, they buy a package and they send it to every city and it's the same thing. It's no, there's no production. I think I think black people will, will like to pay a little bit more money if they have something more to look at. So I think it's a, it's the economics. It's uh, I don't the mental part of it. It's, it's in black. That's black and white and everything else. You know, we're, we're musicians. We all a little crazy. When I was in high school, my music teacher told me he said, you know, if you're a musician, we all slightly, slightly a little crazy for being musicians. And I kind of believe that. So, you know, we, we're in this field because we love it. We love the sound of it. Some of us love it and some of us don't love it. The ones who are doing it, like, like Smokey and Patty, they've been doing it for their whole life and they're still here to do this interview today um, because they, they love it and it's always something they have to give to an audience. And that's how I feel. I love music. I mean, honestly, I was doing it for free for so long. When I got some money, I was surprised. We all were. <laughs> when, I, when I said that I'm blessed, if you could see, Raphael, if you could see where I grew up, especially now, if you, if you can see I've that. I've seen you know, where you grown up. I've been there. I've been to your place in Detroit. Okay, cool, man. So you know what I'm talking about. And to get, like I said, the blessing. of come Because, man, there were some dudes in my neighborhood, because we used to have group battles and stuff like that. And when we had the group battles, if, in fact, <clears throat> the four aims, who turned out to be the four tops, they were the four aims back in the day in Detroit. And if they were going to show up, the best you were going for was second place. You know, that was, the, that was the best you were going to get with second place if they showed up. You know what I'm saying? Right. But we used to have group battles all the time, man. And basically, we sang for the girls, you know. And, and, and we on the corner, at school, at the recreation center, and we had these group battles and stuff. You know, and there were some dudes in my neighborhood that would sing me under the table. You understand? I mean, under the table. Sing, they would sing Levi under the table. You know what Ooh. I mean? If you, wow. you know what I mean? If you, yeah. Dudes like that in the neighborhood. Never got a break. Mm -hmm. Never got out. Yeah. Never got that break that, you know, that, that would cause you to be able to be known or whatever it was. Like I said, I'm blessed, baby, because I, I grew up in a neighborhood like that where there was a thousand groups and, thousand, and everybody was singing, you know. I, you know and, but some of us were blessed and we got out of there and we got the break. One of the greatest days of my life was when I met Barry Gordy, because I, I, I actually, Jackie Wilson was my number one singing idol back in those days. I would walk 20 miles to go see Jackie Wilson somewhere, you know, <clears throat> and we got a chance to go audition for Jackie Wilson's managers. And they hated us you know, because they hated us because they said we would never make it because we had a girl in our group. And the platters were out. The platters were the number one group in the world at that time. And, and Zola was in the group and Tony was a high singer. And they said, okay, you singing high, you got a girl in the group and all of that. We don't need any more platters. So y'all will never make it. So we sorry, that's it. It just so happens, like I tell everybody it was a God day because it just so happens that this was before he had started Motown and Barry Gordy was the one who was writing all the hits for Jackie Wilson. So it just so happens that he was there that day just so happened, he happened to be there that day. It was a God day. It was a God day, yeah. man, because he had to be there that day. And what happened with us is that we went there and we sang five songs that I had written. And rather than singing something that was currently popular by other artists and stuff. And so the guys told us, they said, 
you know, you'll never make it because of the planet. But Barry was at that meeting. He was at that audition. And he happened to like two of my songs, man. And after the audition was over, he came out and introduced himself. And a year or so later, I mean, he started to manage us and, uh, that almost immediately. But a year or so later was when he started Motown. So like I said, that was a God day. It was a God day for me, man, because, because it was just, we didn't have to be there that day that he was there. He didn't have to be there that day that we were there, but it was a God day. And that was my ticket out of there. That was my ticket out of where you wouldn't saw. <laughs> you know, that was my ticket out of there, man. And God has set that up. So I, I say it was a God day because it didn't have to happen like that, man. And like I said, and I, and I see people all the time talking about, well, you know, so-and-so singing and the people get a cocky and all this because they got a hit regular. If you think you can sing, let me take you to my church on Sunday. And you hear yeah. Sister Maybell get down <laughs> on your ass, okay? If you think you can sing, let me let you take, take you to church and you hear Sister Maybell, you know, or, or Brother John or one of them. You know, when you get a break in this business, it's a blessing. It's a break. Mm -hmm. And you got to look at it. You gotta, I cherish it. And Thanks then once you have that about, break. I'm loving it. I love yeah. it with all my heart. I can't even imagine anything else that I could be or want to be that I would love like this. You know what I mean? I, that, I, yeah, I still do it. I'm, I'm going to be doing this when I'm 100. I tried retiring one time. And mm -hmm. I retired for about three years and went apeshit. You know, just went crazy, <laughs> just climbing the walls. You know what I mean? And oh, that's what Barry Gordy said. Barry Gordy told me, he told me, I was, I was vice president of Motown, man. He told me, he said, get your ass out of here. You get, you get out of here. Make a record, please. Make a record and get out of here. Because I'm sick of you walking around here looking like you're miserable and all that. And if I see you miserable, this is what he told me. If I see you miserable, it makes me miserable. So you get out of my face. So that was when I decided, okay. He's right, because I'm doing all this vice presidential corporate shit and all what all excuse me, y'all, just corporate <laughs> stuff. Corporate stuff and doing that. all that, you know. And and it's okay, it's fine, you know, but it ain't music. It ain't me making some music. It ain't me going to the Apollo. It ain't me, it, it ain't that. You know what I mean? Me. Once you get that moment when you're at that, you get that break, you get that God day, what are the best ways? that you guys have seen, you guys have participated in to lift others up in order to keep the culture going, keeping this music uh, by, by, by By example, baby, I, 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 I do it by example. I, I tell people all the time, especially young people, uh, I, I love this. I can't think of anything else that I would love like this, but not only do I love it, I respect it. I respect it. I don't think it's smoky. If I was the grocer, all these people, the girls that come and they scream and they do all this stuff like that, a man has to realize that comes with the territory. If I think I'm the bomb because they did this this week because I'm there and they're screaming, let Bruno Mars come next week and just overshadow whatever it was that I did. You know what I'm saying? That's what it comes with the territory. So why should I be thinking, oh man, I'm Smokey Robinson and so I, I got it. No, you're not. No, I'm not. I'm a blessed man. I'm, I'm very, 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 very humility. blessed. Humility. Yeah. And to be able to do this, uh, how long have we been doing this, Patty? 60 years? How long? We, yeah, we, you know, I met this woman when I was a teenager. We were doing teenagers out on the road together. And, and you know, and, and whoever told her, whoever the dude was told her about her nose and her singing and all that, he needed his <laughs> ass kicked. <laughs> you know, whoever that was. He had a kick. You know, because this girl been blowing like that since she was 13. Since, since I met her, she's been blowing like that ever since. Probably, and, and I tell people this too, ain't no new artists. There are no new artists. You see somebody come along, I'll use Michael Jackson as an example of that. When I first met Michael Jackson, he was 10 years old. He was not a new artist. He'd been singing and doing that stuff like that since he was five. There ain't no new artists. But when you see somebody, they get a break and they come in and they're playing something or, they, or they're singing something or something like that. They've been doing that for a long time. I don't care if they're 10. They've been doing it for at least five, six years, you know? So it's a struggle. And it's a dues paying yeah. thing. You have to pay your dues, you know? You, you pay your dues, but then again, you got to love it and you got to understand 
that it ain't you. It's your business. You didn't start it. You ain't gonna finish it. It was going <laughs> you ain't your, before it. before your great 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 grandmama was here. Mm. People singing, singing for people and entertaining and all that. You know, you mm. didn't start it, and you ain't gonna finish it. So, if you know those things, and if you respect it, and if you love it, and if you know that it's not you personally, that you know you the bomb, you do this, you know. If you understand that then you got a chance to make it. And you got a chance to be around like me and this woman right here for 60 some years and, and people know you. This woman is one, one of the most lovable people I've ever known in my entire life, in my life. Thank you. I love this conversation. I love this love fest. And I love how much we've talked about learning from the past and, and preserving in the present. And I wanna steer the conversation a little bit to the future of of black music of where we're going of how there can be redemptive measures and also how we can keep this going so our great 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 grandkids still gonna have it and still love so miss patty i'll ask you with with so much changing in terms of music school curriculum and people finding their voice in the church where do you think the next generation of musicians is being nurtured and do you see anyone that you are inspired by in that set? Oh my gosh. I see a lot of people that I'm inspired by. If I say two, I'll miss uh, 18 because it's like 20. 20 new singers that I love and I don't want to get my face broke. So I won't say who they are. They would never. Oh, honey. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to take that chance. <laughs> you know, but music is going to be, it's, as long as we stay Black, and don't fall into any other category. Like for me, I think there was a question that someone's going to ask me, have I broken any rules in this business to be, to be who I am? And I think I broke the rules of not following, not following trends. But what I would say is that I've broken rules by not following mm. the hot stuff. Like what's hot today is not for Patty. I have to be true to myself and, and have a song written for me that's age appropriate, that makes a lot of sense to me, and that will make people say, oh, she's she's still cool. I mean, I'm 77, and I'm still trying to be, I'm not you're trying to be, I am. And you're a baby. What'd you say? <laughs> I'm an old baby, right? <laughs> but I'm a good baby, because I'm an honest baby, Smokey, you know, and I, I sing yeah, the baby. music. I mean, I probably passed up a lot of hit records because I said no to certain things because I didn't want to get on a certain place in people's mind as a follower. Mm. And I don't even know if I answered your question, but I had to say something like that because that's what I'm feeling. No, that makes perfect sense. And, and my question was more about, definitely about the next generation, but you said the key to it, staying true to yourself, not riding trends, and that's where they're going, yeah. Believe in yourself, yes. Yes. And I see a lot of young girls doing things that they might not love later in life, but they're doing what they have to do now to become famous. I've never wanted to become famous. I just always mm. wanted to be real. You know, mm. so it's a big difference in wanting to do things that are hot or laying back, waiting until your turn. So I've waited for all these years for my turn. And I still haven't gotten my turn yet. But I know as a Black woman, I have to persevere because it's as simple as uh, Celine Dion and I, we did If You Asked Me To. I recorded that song years ago and then she recorded maybe a few years after hers was platinum mine was wood the same arrangement but i have that's to wait exactly that's exactly what i was saying earlier about the difference between yeah. white artists and, and black artists oh they get the props my you know, god can, so you I, imagine, can you imagine can you imagine the 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 magnitude of your career and something if you had been white singing like you sing right. and doing what you yes. do okay. can you imagine uh -huh. the magnitude of your career always think yeah. about it you know what I'm you saying? You know, it's like Gladys and I talk a lot, Gladys. You know, we're just like waiting to exhale mm. because we haven't fully exhaled as black performers. And, um, but you never stop. I can't stop. You know, I'm recording soon. You know, I haven't recorded in 15 years, but it's going oh, to wow. happen soon. Yeah, it's been 15 years because it has to feel right. It has to be right. I can't just say, oh, I want to go in the studio. What for? <laughs> Unless I got something to say. You know, so I've been doing 
I've been doing some work at his uh -huh. studio. I, I'm, I'm in the studio now. Right. I'm actually doing two CDs. I'm doing one. I'm doing one in Spanish. But uh, but really? uh, yeah, wow. yeah, 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 yeah. I'm in the studio right. now, and I'm loving it. You know how it is, baby. Yeah, yeah. And you too, I know. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. He's he's got a he's got a great studio. <laughs> Oh, I heard oh, about know, the studio. My, my thing was uh, with, with artists, we just have to look at like, I mean, Smokey, when I go to Europe years ago, I mean, I was in sitting in the car and some, I heard a group singing a song called, a white group singing a song called When Smokey Sings. Oh. And, and I was like, are they talking about Smokey Robinson? <laughs> and so the whole time I was right. like, man, Smokey got white people singing about him in Europe. So I had to I had to take that and think and process that a little bit. And I was like, hmm. So Motown was pretty much American pie in America and Europe. They were bigger even in Europe, which is hard to believe. Um, yeah. But they were bigger in Europe than they were here um, because people heard something they never heard. The Beatles heard something they never they've never heard before. Um, the reason why I started playing bass, I identify with bass, the instrument before I knew exactly what it was. because My dad played guitar, my brother Dwayne played guitar. And my mom was going fishing and, and I was sitting on top of this cooler and my dad put it in a, a A track and uh Pride and Joy came on. And I just heard the piano go, blah, 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 boom, 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 blah, 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 And from that second, something caught me. I didn't know what it was. And then when I heard the instrument later, I was like, whatever that guy is playing, that's the instrument I wanted. I want yeah. So James Jameson. James Jameson. We had that conversation about James. He was more famous than everybody. The but, bass James, got by. Hey, man. but that music crossed over to a point where it almost made Smokey, almost made you damn near what the white artist was, like bigger. Like you're like you're like the Rolling Stones. I will tell you, I will tell you two two stories to complement what you just said, man. Uh we had, we started Motown, and when we started Motown, we were local. We were only in Detroit. Flint and Ann Arbor, Michigan. So the places we were. Hmm. And in Detroit at that time, there were some places that if you were black and you were in one of those places, you better be working for somebody and you better have something on you that says you work for Miss So-and-so or Mr. So-and-so. If you were in Dearborn or, or Gross Point or, hmm. or Bloomfield Hills or any of those places like that in the Detroit area, the suburbs of Detroit, you better have something on you if you were black. It said you're supposed to be in that neighborhood if you got caught, because if you didn't, the police might beat you up or take you to anything, you know. So we started Motown. We've been going locally for probably about maybe eight, nine months. And we started to get letters from the white kids in those areas where it was taboo for you to be in. And we get letters from them. And see, the hindsight is so powerful because those letters would be invaluable now. I wish I had saved them because there, there ain't a amount of money that you could even put on them. Yeah. And we started getting letters from the white kids saying, hey man, we got your music. We love your music, but our parents don't know that we have it because if they knew that we had it, they so, might make us throw it away. They might make us throw it. So we just letting you know that we got your music and blah, 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 blah. So we read them, oh, this is great. And so we, I don't even know what we even did with them. It was stupid not to keep them. A year or so later, we were getting letters from their parents. Hey man. We found out our kids were listening to your music. So we wanted to know why. So we started listening to the Motown music. We are so glad that they have it. We listen to it now too. We love your music. Now, I'm saying all this to say, and, and he talked about Europe, you know, with music, especially back in the 60s, man, when, when, the, when the civil rights movement was going strong, you know, with music. We were breaking down so many barriers. We were crossing over so many lines that before had been there and you better not cross them or you better not break down this barrier or try to go across this way. We first started going down South Pat, I can tell you this, we go, we play places where if there were white people in the audience, they'd be over into a section by themselves, black folks in a section by themselves, blah, 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 blah so on. White black folks upstairs, white folks downstairs, black folks on this side of the arena, black folks on uh, white folks on this side, or we have a stage in the middle of it. And they, you know, it's just just totally segregated, you know. And after a while, after a year or so of making the music on a, 
we go down there and we see white boys with black girlfriends and black boys with white girlfriends and they're all dancing together and they're all mingling, and doing those things. So we were breaking down barriers with music that they were trying to legislate. They were trying to make people do this and do the government and do the things and blah, blah, blah. We were doing it with music because music is the international language. It's, it's, the, it's the barrier breaker. We, 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 uh, the, only, the only group that I ever knew that, that we had uh, to go to Russia was the Temptations. Temptations came back from Russia. They, they just said, hey, smoke, man. You know what, man? The Iron Curtain is real, man. Cause we got over there when the plane landed, we heard it come down. Plane, this is exactly what so we heard the Iron Curtain come down. And say, yeah. it was really something that said, we were just like frightened, you know, until we started to go and do the shows. People came out in droves. They said they loved us. They sung our songs. This is Russia. We having a cold war with Russia back in those days. Well, you know, Russia, you know. So we were breaking down barriers with music because music is the man. Uh -huh. music, music is the man. Music is really, really, really a barrier breaker, you know? And um, I, I'm, very, I'm very proud of the fact that I'm in music and, and, and that I had a chance to be involved in something that would break down barriers like that. That, yeah, would, that, yeah. would, that, would, that would cause the races to say, hey, this is our common love. We love this too. So let's get together, you know? Yeah, in terms of boundary, boundary breaking, it's continued to still break more boundaries, set new records, new superlatives. Even now, yeah. as of 2017, hip hop and R&B is the most consumed, most marketed, most toured genre in America. And I think about the new horizons that will reach together. And, and Jinzia, I wanna ask you, as, a, as a, another member of the media, what changes do you see coming up on the horizon in terms of how black creators, black musicians are continuing to break boundaries, but also be protected and credited properly in the process? I think that it's important in media for journalists of color, particularly black journalists, to be given a space in order to properly and fairly cover black artists who are coming up in the field. And I think that I go back to this because when we talk about who's being given the space to, you know, advocate, I think that sometimes we aren't seeing a fair picture. Of, of the field and we aren't giving people the platform that they deserve. And that's just my thinking from my kind of journalistic standpoint, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And in terms of new horizons, this is, this is like one of my last questions and I wanna pose it to everybody and have us have more brainstorm conversations about it. What is most encouraging to you about the way black music is headed, about where it's going? I'll say two words to you, and uh, and he's my man too, and really cool. You know, and you never would have thought this, Snoop Dogg. How you so? Know? Because Snoop started out as a gangster rapper. You know what I mean? And that was what he was. And 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 most white people, I guess, were banning their kids from even listening to what Snoop was saying. You know, the the parents were trying. You know, but it didn't matter to the kids because they started dressing hip hop. They started wearing their pants down below their butt, you know, and the, the hat, hats cocked over to the side, the big jackets, the big everything. They started emulating the rap artists, you know. Snoop was a real, real, real gangster rapper. Snoop is everywhere now. He deserved to because Snoop's a man. I, I love Snoop. But Snoop is all on TV every day. He's doing all the commercials you can think of. He's doing TV shows. He's doing this and that. So, Snoop Dogg is my best example right now. I mean, it's a lot of people like that, but he's my best example as to where it's going and the acceptance of the music and how people have accepted rap. You know, when people first start, they, they, they were talking about rap because they said, well, you know, rap is bad and rap is this and rap is that. No, 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 no. Rap ain't got nothing to do with that. I know some Christian rappers. You know what I'm saying? I know some dudes who rap about the Lord. So rap ain't got nothing to do with it. It's your, your lyrical content that has something to do with what the music is, but they condemned all rap because of gangster rap. Now, if you're gonna do that, you gotta condemn. When I was a teenager, when I was growing up, I never knew how to do this, 
but they said, you know, some of the rock records and coming out, if you played them backwards, you were going to get a satanic message. <laughs> right. I never knew how to play a record backwards, you know, but you're going to get a satanic because because there's always been negative music, always, and there's always been positive music. But for rap to come as far as it's come, and everybody's into it, and everybody's buying it, and all the kids in Europe and everywhere, you know, and that's my my thing of where the future of music is because music as a whole is being more widely accepted than it ever has been in history. I can say that I'm very impressed with her getting an Oscar, singing her music and being accepted and beating out some of the white chicks. You know, mm -hmm. she's positive, she's a go-getter and she's young and her mind is right. And I, I believe in her and I believe in what she's going to become. And yeah. Snoop too. <laughs> Snoop too. Well said, well said. Yes. Uh-huh. I'm gonna start off with like Mr. Marvin Gaye would say, you know, what's going on? Mm -hmm. I can tell you what's going on. Well, I thought this phone call was about it, Marvin Gaye, actually, when I took it, this thing, but it was, this is even better talking about the future of black music. But what's going on to me is like, I actually work with Snoop since Snoop started. We work a lot together. We talk every day on the phone. So it's just funny that, you know, that you brought mm -hmm. Snoop up. But I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about the, the younger generation, what I do like about them. They're not so fast to want a record deal anymore because so many groups are being shelved. So many kids are being streamed. They're not making any money. It's not so flattering to have a record deal anymore. So everybody, they're trying to change rules and change laws. That's what I like about the younger generation. And even the older generation is, uh, you know, helping with legislation like Smokey, Ray Parker Jr. Uh, are all going down to trying to change rules, uh, laws and things like that. But the younger generation like Giveon, um, uh, uh, the internet, Mustafa the Poet, um, Hello Yellow, um, her, all these, um, Steve Lacey, all of these are Thundercat, you know, all these kids are like really dope, really fresh, really paying attention to what happened beforehand and trying to do better. I feel like it has to be Learning. like sports, you know, uh -huh. it needs to be like sports. You know, you have Magic Johnson, but now you have LeBron and you have Steph Curry. The contracts get bigger. They make more money. The generation, the general generational wealth continues. I feel like the new generation is not they all they want to be artists. They love music just like all of us. But they also want to make money. They want to, when they get done, they want to be, they don't want their kids, you know, like running to some executive and like, oh, your dad was on my label, but your dad is broken. My dad is a billionaire. These kids want to be the same as the executives. So I think that's where music is going. It's going to, the music is going to get better. Kids are like paying attention to like having live music. They don't want to sound like everybody else. And the, uh, what's so popular in the world today is what's, what wasn't popular in the other world was, Nobody wanted to be a follower. Like Patty LaBelle said, the word follower was a, the, the wackest word, was the worst word, word in our business to be a follower. Everybody sound different. I think now the future of what's happening, what's going on is people want to be, they want to be different. They want to, um, they want the gatekeepers to open it up, to let them be who they are. People like Barry Gordy and also Ed Eckstein, who was the CEO of my label when I came out, they didn't know what to do with the Tonys. We played music. We we liked Motown. We liked Earth, Wind and Fire. We liked the Commodores. We liked Kim Funk. We we wanted to be like them. And somebody, the gatekeepers like Ed Eckstein at that time, which he's Billy Eckstein's son. He was hanging around Quincy Jones. He opened the door and let us be who we were gonna be. I think now, speaking of Snoop, Snoop just got named uh, uh, an executive at uh, Def Jam Records um, last week. And he's going to be the type of person, like a gatekeeper, that's going to let people, some people get through the gate with like, who do you want to be without being scared to say, you know, because I feel like there's a lot of black executives that have jobs that are scared to speak up for black people, black kids yes. and letting them be who they, who they are. Barry Gordy let, he saw Smokey Robinson say, you know what, Smokey, be Smokey. Marvin, uh, I don't want you, really want you to sing what's going on, but since you said you're never going to record a record for me ever again, unless you let me do it. <laughs> he let him do it. And like, you know, now when I listen to what's going on, that record is not never, it, it's never got old. It's what's, we, we all still wondering what's going on, right? So I feel like the younger generation and uh, or my generation and every generation, it's just a family tree. There, uh, Isaac Hayes told me this one cool thing. He said, he said, um, there's no such thing as old school. It's either you went to school or you didn't, you know? Either you know or you don't. 
you know, you know. And a lot of younger kids, they know what's, what's kind of what's happening. And I feel like the uh, music is about to get a lot better. I felt like in every generation, there was good music when Motown was out. I'm sure and the OJs was out. There was good music, but there was also not so good music out too, right? But now the musical, I'm glad I grew up on the music I grew up on. I wouldn't change it for the world. I wouldn't want to be born today. Well, I wouldn't want to be born in like 92. And then I, what I'm listening to today is that's that's the bar because I felt like all the CEOs really love music. Like, you know, I heard, I heard something um, in, um, in uh, Marvin Gaye's book when, when he said, Barry Gordy said, his three favorite singers was Sam Cooke, uh, uh, Jackie Wilson, and, and Sam Cooke. I mean, the bar is high. The bar is high. I feel like the bar has been low for so long, but I think the kids are much smarter now and the kids want to raise the bar. That's what I see the future. That's the future. Yeah. Raising the bar. And you, you mentioned, yeah. you mentioned what's going on, man. You mentioned what's going on and, and uh, you know, many times in my life still, people ask me, well, Smokey, you know, what's your favorite song? I have no idea. You know, I've been listening to music ever since I could hear. So I have no <laughs> idea. And, and I, I had a great dose of music growing up because everything was being played at our house. I mean, classical, blues, gospel, jazz. My sister listened to the music called bebop and all that. Yeah, everything was being played there, you know. And I could not possibly tell you what my favorite song was because I've been hearing music like that. But my favorite album of all times, is what's going on. When I when Marvin was 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 writing what's going on, he lived around the corner from me. I go to his house, said I'm trying to get him to go, we're getting ready to do something or something like that. He said, Smoke, God is writing this album. I said, oh. yeah, I said, cool, man. He said, yeah, he said, God is writing this. He said, I'm just sitting there, I'm just receiving, because God is writing this album. Okay. You listen to what's going on today. It's more poignant today than it was when it came out. Exactly. It's prophecy. Timeless. It's prophecy. prophecy. Exactly. It's Timeless. prophecy. So I can believe God wrote it because it's prophecy. Because the things that he's talking about in that are way more happening now than they were when it came out. It was happening mm -hmm. then, but not as much or as, or as prevalent as it is now. You know, trigger happy yeah. police and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, man. Yeah. I believe God wrote it. Surely. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> Ms. Gen Zia, what is most encouraging to you? about where music is going. I mean, I love what Raphael just said. Was that Isaac Hayes that he said? Isaac that, Hayes, yeah. You know, you either went to school, or you didn't. I think, you know, it, that just got my, my mind thinking because you were talking about how that's, artists are, are considering that, right? And that's what's making new artists smart and effective today. I even think of that in terms of, you know, the work I'm doing with the library is to also help the audience, right? The consumer, the people who are listening to music to go to school, you know, to get this education, to get this history lesson. Cause all of us here, we appreciate black music so deeply. I think because we have that deep understanding and that fondness and that connection to the history. Whereas I don't know if all audiences always do. And so for me, something that encourages me when I think about the history of black music and then the future of black artists in this industry is knowing that I think things are changing. I think thing, I think audiences are starting to give credit where credit is due and are starting to recognize um, their role also in sustaining and uplifting artists for the future. And keep building on the entire community. Right. Yeah. Yeah. This has been an amazing conversation. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all. This has been Protect Black Music preservation, legacy, and protecting the history of Black music. Presented by the Recording Academy's Black Music Collective. Thank you all so much for the panelists for being here today. And thank you for joining us and listening along. Hi everyone, Jerry L. Johnson here, executive sponsor of the Black Music Collective. And what a powerful conversation that was on the preservation of Black music with true legends and leaders in the culture. So thank you so much to our panelists, and to our moderator for that special conversation that we just had. So at the heart and at the center of our mission with the Black Music Collective is inclusion, advancement, and recognition. And because of that, we know that recognition has to start with recognizing that next generation of leaders and creators who will lead us into the future. And so because of that, we are so proud to have partnered with Amazon Music 
to present the first ever Your Future Is Now HBCU scholarships to three very deserving students who are currently enrolled at historically black colleges or universities. And so here to help us announce the three recipients of these $10,000 scholarships who herself continues to inspire the next generation every single day in so many different ways. Please welcome four time Grammy Award winner, Her. Hey everyone, this is Her and I'm here to announce the recipients for the first ever Black Music Collective Amazon Music HBCU Your Future Is Now scholarships. Supporting the next generation is so important to us, which is why we've come together with Amazon Music to provide three scholarships to aspiring music professionals attending HBCUs. Thank you so much to everyone who applied. We see you and we encourage you to keep following your dreams. Unfortunately, we can only pick three. So here we go. The first recipient of the Black Music Collective Amazon Music $10,000 HBCU scholarship is an attendee of Morehouse College, Akil Evans. Woo! Congratulations, Akil. Your future is now. The second recipient of the Black Music Collective Amazon Music $10,000 HBCU scholarship is an attendee at Howard University, Naya Hardman. Congratulations, Naya. Your future is now. The third and final recipient of the Black Music Collective Amazon Music $10,000 HBCU scholarship is an attendee of North Carolina Central University. Congratulations, Jawan Davidson. Jawan, your future is now. Big congratulations. Congrats to everybody. I'm so proud of you. You should be so proud of yourselves. And I look forward to hopefully crossing paths with you one day. Hi, everyone. I'm Felicia. Hey, everyone. I'm Riggs Morales, chair of the Black Music Collective. And on behalf of the Recording Academy and the Black Music Collective, we first want to thank you for joining us for tonight's program. As we begin to close out Black Music Month, we are reminded of the contributions and impact of Black music year round and across the globe. As we look to the future, we cannot forget our history and our past and continue to deepen our focus on the preservation of Black music and the contributions of Black music artists and professionals across the globe. You're so right, Valicia. It's so important that we preserve Black music through education. Generationally, hip hop and R&B does its history a disservice. So until more schools and parents make a concentrated effort to teach Black music, I think it's up to us in the positions that we hold to educate and pass it along. Remember that the previous works inspires the new and the new inspires the next. That's how we keep the ecosystem of Black music thriving and continuing to influence the music landscape the way it does today. And while we're at it, I want to send a big congratulations to the recipients of the first ever Black Music Collective Amazon Music Your Future Is Now HBCU Scholarship. The future is in good hands. It is in your hands.